Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to come and talk today. Um, my name is Nina Kerke, and I'm a professor in geospatial research at the University of Turku Department of Geography and Geology. And, and I will today share a bit of the, perhaps related to the last speaker's last words about risk assessment, a bit different approach to open science, which starts from the, from the community perspective, not that much of the uh, infrastructures that we create to enable data sharing, but people. And how do we work with the communities to, to engage and thrive open science? And additionally, I will also take you outside of the comfort zone of Finland to East Africa, where I've been working for the last 20 years in advancing issues on, on geospatial data and working with geospatial technologies and applications. Um, through this um, 20 years of experience, taking myself outside of my own comfort zone, it has taught me a lot of issues related to what is the significance of collaborative work. And even though in the era of COVID, it's perhaps not appropriate to say, but I just returned last week from Tanzania to, to meet the community because the community is everything. Without that, you cannot really do meaningful work. And open science advancement is very difficult. We had a two weeks training and community engagement events with our collaborators for universities to advance issues in learning new digital geospatial data skills through open access learning environments and how to use them in the education. What I've learned over these years is that working in and with communities which confront a lot of complex problems, social ecological problems of, of life quality, technical problems of accessing information and solutions, it puts you to think what is it that we can do in the academia to advance the growth of the knowledge and skills in order to make an input outside of the academia to that of the society. And one of the reasons why I tell this story today is that at the same time as these communities that we have been working with lack a lot of those resources, which we often appreciate a lot in our cultures, they have a very dense social matrix and local knowledge richness, which has potential to grow into innovations and solutions that make disruptions and leaps in the development, if conditions such allow. Thus, today I will talk primarily how to accelerate growth of knowledge, skills, and societal impacts with open science actions. Before going into the story, and I will take you to the grass level, grassroot level stories today, I would like to make a statement against which I hope you reflect the stories that I, I'll share today. I do believe strongly that transformation, transformative change, meaning change that goes beyond the knowledge that we have in the academic institutions to that of the society, can actually be done in today's digitalized world with open data and technology in the context of social matrix, if we do that in an efficient way. That is a rather holistic uh, process in, in, in total. What we can say is that the data and the technology there, they are transition enablers. What is wonderful to see today is that the technology and data has become much more global than it has ever been. But the problem is that how do you localize something which is global? How do you make it as a vehicle for development, for knowledge growth in a local context? One of the key issues is that we have to train people who are capable of doing this transformation. As much as there is research efforts on open data, we need education efforts coupled with research actions. And ed education, I don't mean only formal education, I, know, I mean learning opportunities. Every single time we engage the community, we engage them into a process of co-design learning and reflection. New generation competencies and skills are not only data skills, they are skills of critical thinking, creativity, collaborative ways of working, and they are, they are skills of understanding how do we make change that is more sustainable for the prosperity of the humanity and the, and the planet. When we are working in the digital era, it is really wonderful nowadays that we can engage anybody on this planet just with a little device on our hands with the access to internet, to many digital learning environments. The problem is whether people know where these are and whether they know how to use them. 
in order to advance this, you actually have to do this in a very grassroots level. Take them through the process of using them is the way to do it. It's not about telling how to do it, it's about doing it together. Open, accessible, interactive learning environments have a scalability potential, but they need advocates to do that. They need people who know how to do it. In all these, this complexity of the world, the most important thing is that when we train future generation open data experts, all of us are experts in the society with open data, we need to understand the needs of the society. There are problems we try to solve, and those are the vehicles for us being motivated to do open science. Need-driven approach to anything that we do guarantees that we have a perspective and motivation and a goal and a target, which then puts us to do the effort. It's not about regulations and rules. It's about the opportunity space that we see when we start solving the challenges we are confronting in our daily lives. Thus, today I will go through, unfortunately, with a very short time, but nevertheless, go through with a couple of case examples. There are two use cases that are highlighting um, research actions that we've been doing together with our academic and practitioner, practitioner parties in Tanzania on two particular topics, participatory forest research, resource mapping and then local land use planning, both research case examples that are in the interface between science and practice. I will show you a bit how the open data and open science approach is materialized in those cases. Then I will take you into the community-driven learning examples the other one coming, uh, or both of these coming from our own society, though they are much grounded on the experience that we have had in, the, in, in Tanzania and then implemented here, mapathons as a way to learn digital skills and humanitarian skills in high schools in Finland. And then our own University of Turku Geonode, uh, uh, basically spatial data infrastructure and platform, where, which is done and operating based on the community approaches. And then lastly, I will share you with a, with a bit broader example of Resilience Academy, a partnership that we have with the World Bank and several universities on advancing open science knowledge networking and acceleration in, in the global south as a whole. Let's look at the first example. This is a use case we did a couple of years ago in um, Southern Highlands area of Tanzania. It started with a problem addressed to us by, by forestry actors. Uh, there's, there's large investments uh, regarding um, commercial forestry in, in Tanzania, but the problem is that nobody knows at the moment where the plantation for forests are located. So when you do a, an intervention like that, an investment to an economic uh, growth of the country, it is very risk, risky if you don't even know what are the current resources and where to allocate the new ones. So we started discussing um, between the Ministry of Natural Resources and Tourism, UN Food and Agricultural Organization, University of Turku, local universities, and the development cooperators, the actors and investors, that how could we create a methodology that could be cost efficient, repeatable, contextually clever, based on open data, based on open technology, and in a way that the locals can actually repeat it to monitor the growth of the forests in the long run. We ended up using FAO's Open Forest platform, which is an open source toolkit designed particularly for resource mapping in the, in the countries where the resource infrastructures are weak. We combined that with a community engagement of through a mapathon, spent two weeks with 25 people, first trained them to do interpretation of high resolution satellite images, to collect over 6,000 samples, over 200,000 square kilometers of land, which then was used in machine learning algorithms in Google Earth Engine to classify and identify the concentrations of plantation forests, which were then validated with the data that these communities collected and then shared with them through training sessions so that we can build the capacity of repeating this methodology together with the local university. Now that story ended up with the with a open source data, open source code, as well as training materials and practitioners uh, support, and of course, a scientific paper with open data for other researchers to continue working with. 
Another use case is about uh, participatory land, land use planning. We have a decade long work with participatory data collection in, in Tanzania, and we have always dreamt, dreamt about the, an opportunity to link the science with practitioners' work. And it happened so that Tanzanian National Land Use Com Commission is doing village land use plans, which is the local level land use planning process in Tanzania. But the process is very weak in terms of its technology implementation. It's understandable in the rural areas. What we wanted to do is to test whether there's a simple way of enhancing the quality of land use planning and make it, make it more democratic and participatory also for the local communities. Well, the simple thing that we did was that instead of people drawing their land use plans on white blank paper, which then gets transferred into a digital data system without a proper reference, which is basically useless data at the end of the day, we introduced high resolution satellite image print, prints. You can see this picture here where the local communities are looking into their houses, their life, life world, their localities, and they do mapping of valuable assets of land that they have, and they then end up designing their own land use plan. This methodology was endorsed so much by the local ministry that it was turned into a manual and it has been now replicated in over 60 villages throughout the region where these village land use plans have been made. And just yesterday we had a dialogue of, of discussion with the local practitioners of how we could advance this further. For us as scientists, it was not about um, discovering the most brightest technological thing, but it was about the context of the technology in the meaningful way so that the open science can make a contribution to the society. Again, data for the practitioners and a science for us as scientists. The third case is about the learning, the tools. And we have many years discussed with the geography teachers in high schools that how could we enhance digital learning environments so that the learning environments would be at the same time advancing the practical skills of the students, but also linking students' broader understanding of the value of technology to the society. Well, humanitarian aid is one of the sectors globally which needs a lot of access to digital data. Give you an example. There's an NGO in Tanzania who is trying to, to um, go to the local villages to educate people against uh, genital mutilation. And they need data of, of where the houses are and where are the roads, how to access the villages. High school students, 70 of them in 2019, they were mapping in three high schools in Turku, the area where the NGO is operating through a three hour mapathon. For them, it was a learning experience of geospatial data skills, using the technology, learning a bit of earth observation, understanding the humanitarian work and understanding how the sustainability of the future is related to the thing that they do. If you're interested, you can look at the video which was made out of this, um, this mapathon. It was highly, highly educative for all of us. But the way we facilitated this was that our students from the university who are active in, in an NGO called Egea Turku, it's a geographical association of students, they were taking the responsibility of facilitating the, the event. Us as university teachers, we were endorsing this process by giving students who did that some credits into their learning so that they benefit also for their, to their studies. And the high school students were the ones who were doing the data collection and their teachers were endorsing this. Now this methodology is wrapped up into an open access uh, material to digicampus.fi and scaled to other teachers and schools so that it can be used openly and repeatedly. The fourth case is about uh, our own data services. For years, I've been dreaming that there would be a motivating way for researchers to share their digital geospatial data. Well, I know, and I'm very much aware of all the formalities related to this, but I have always said that the formalities do not guarantee that we actually do it. Researchers' work is full of things and we are, we are engaged in many things. How could we then lower the threshold of willingness to share your data? What is the added value? that we as scientists get, and what is the added value for the society? We started a couple of years ago the development of this geospatial data service, not yet even publicly actually opened. You are the first audience to hear about it, but uh, we will organize an event around this. But 
Um, I, I, I was thinking that there needs to be some other way of doing this. It's not that we need to force the, t the researchers to share their data. We need to make it somehow motivating. So I, then I thought that why not link this into a learning experience? And, and now this um, open source technology platform, it's done with a geonode, is operating and we are piloting it so that we have made together with the students who are enrolling in master's uh, course called Geospatial Data Management and Visualization. One of the tasks in that course is that they are learning data quality issues, open data quality issues and data sharing issues. And then they address these via the quality protocol, the curation protocol that they have designed. This, is, this was designed a couple of years ago with the as a student work. And now the, this year, the students were interviewing researchers who were willing to give their data and helping the researchers to publish their data by acting as curators. Community curators, side by side with the researchers, helping them to share their data. And not only share the data, but to visualize the data layers so that they are with, uh, with uh, accessible openly. And that there is a message attached to the data. And that was done via data stories. So the students were interviewing the researchers and they were personalizing the story around the data and publishing it alongside with the data layers in this service. How did we then do this as a community exercise in the course was that we had a data party. So the work ended up in a one morning at the university where we had some snacks and, and uh, coffee and then we gathered around the team of the students and they, everybody published their data, the researchers data at the same time and their stories. And then we also did a round of, of um, visual assessment of the map layers and, and discussed about the quality and, and experience around the data. What I would like to see is this kind of activity from the grassroots level to grow into a, a ways of sharing your data rather than thinking that there is a regulation or order to share your data, but that there is actually a motivation to do it. And it's motivation not only for the researcher, but that there is a learning opportunity for the younger generation. For the job market that much needs data curators and experts, I do believe. The last example is the acceleration of this type of activity. A couple of years ago, Wealth Bank contacted us in Tanzania to discuss about the establishment of Resilience Academy. From the World Bank side, this was related to how they, as a very high level, organization investing on data economy in the global south how can they accelerate the new generation growth of digital data skills and actions in a way that it's sustainable they knew that our long-term work with the local universities and together we have now over the last three years implemented resilience academy in tanzania as a pilot which now is in front of being scaled to other countries first probably in Africa, but also elsewhere. The idea here is that the, one of the obstacles of development in the global South is access or limited access to information, limited access and limited existence of up-to-date digital data. And we know that uh, countries in the global South are rapidly developing and the population growth and the urbanization is creating a lot of risks for the well-being of this wealth. If we can remove the impediments of access of information, up-to-date information, we can increase the, the re resilience of planning cities and planning the countries more reliably. Resilience Academy is addressing this issue by training young generation of, of university graduates with tools, knowledge, and skills to address these problems in the society with open, affordable, and locally adaptable technologies. It's not about taking the fancy technology levels automatically somewhere else. It's about finding what is the change factor for the contextual challenges that these societies are facing. And one of the crucial issues in the, in the value proposal of Resilience Academy is that let's do it by a community approaches. So let's turn the top down approach of the World Bank to low to, to bottom up approach. And this has been one of the crucial ways of, of operating in Resilience Academy. And as an accelerator, we do four things as a service of open science towards the society. First is a climate risk database, an open access data repository of risk data. Whenever there's digital data, we'll store it, we'll license it, we share it, 
and we train people to do this locally. We turn the skills around resilience into e-learning materials, mini learning materials and entities that can be integrated into the local curricula or offered to anyone in the society without any restrictions. How then the data is actually created is through mass internships of students. We have had over 1,000 students so far in Dar es Salaam, Morogoro, Zanzibar, Tanga, Mwanza, different cities, mapping the local landscapes, collecting data, collecting the missing data. That data is now in OpenStreetMap, but it's also in our climate risk database. Now, when you have an open science ecosystem like this, it accelerates a lot of opportunities for innovations and research. The community around Resilience Academy in Tanzania is more or less around 50 different actors of private companies, government organizations, different um, non-governmental actors, universities, and so forth. And it, this sprouts constantly new opportunities. Resilience Academy is, um, is a partnership in Tanzania between University of Turku and four universities locally. There's also international universities partnered with us. The funding has come from the UK aid via the Tanzania Urban Resilience Program and via our own funding, GeoICT for E, which comes from the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Finland. This community has been now building, and I will just quickly show to finish my talk, a couple of those services in more detail. Climate Risk Database is an open source geospatial data repository, is a spatial data infrastructure, which is community maintained and driven. It is currently technically hosted at the University of Turku, but it's maintained, updated, and managed by the local universities. There are currently 140 open licensed geospatial data sets and 350 community members registered as users of this service. Here in the background, by the way, you see the current density of OpenStreetMap in Africa. There it, has, it is remarkable. It's primarily done via community mapping approaches in various, in various projects and initiatives. As a collaborative data sharing platform, it means that we are training the younger generation. Here's a team of young Tanzanian and IT experts who are the Geonode architects. The second on the left, Masud is the one who is our key IT architect of, of Geonode. And he and his team were here together with GeoSolutions, a company that, is, that has been doing a work with us to develop the technical platform. And now we have the protocol for data curation that we have co-developed. After a couple of weeks, we have a training session again in Tanzania to facilitate this learning process. Uh, the e-learning assets that we have been building as part of the Resilience Academy are hosted in Digi Campus here. It's another task that University of Turku has taken as a facilitator of open source learning platform. The contents are co-developed and last week we were training one of the modules. At the moment, the, the amount of learning materials is 15 European credits. And uh, of course, we are extending this to 40 to 50 credits via our GeoICT project currently. The idea is really that these are not self-standing courses, but they are elements of learning open access that can be localized as the teachers like in their own universities. Just to give you a highlight of what type of work students can do in when they do community data collection, here is an example from Zanzibar, 50 students eight weeks working with a local company, mapping the municipalities. 150 kilometers of roads, 35,000 buildings, 5,800 businesses. And they, when this is repeated every single year, there is an up-to-date digital data, which is much faster, much more reliable, and much more rewarding way of creating digital data, rather than hiring an expert to do it, as you can all imagine. And then during the pandemic, we also were piloting rather large effort together with the German Aerospace Center, World Bank and Resilience Academy and one company called Mind Earth to create a way of uh, digital employment for the youth as at the same time as they are studying their skills. This was an effort during 2020 when COVID was very bad and we didn't have a chance to do normal um, proper uh, engagement in the field, in the communities. We engage 120 students throughout Tanzania to do mobile mapping and validation of, a, of 
images of urban space, the task that they were given was basically to identify what, how many buildings are in the picture and what is the, what, how many floors are there in the buildings. These data were geocoded. They were coming from street view images all over Africa. And German Aerospace Center's machine learning algorithms were then using this data to calculate the urban density into a global data, which is a data for common, the data that is openly and publicly available. We are just waiting for it to be published now, but it is a 3D and 2D data of density of urban infrastructures all over the world, going to be repeatedly repeated and updated every three months automatically. And it is an example of an investment of the World Bank into data commons, common data that can advance big leaps and transitions, but which cannot work if you don't have local validation for it. And this was a pilot done in five different countries in Africa. Resilience Academy was one of the team members doing that. And what our, our engagement showed that because we had strong community of students and universities, everybody was very highly engaged into the work. And students felt that they learned skills and the data product quality was very good, what the, what the, da the data that they actually collected. We do see that this is one of the future ways of increasing employment in, in rapidly developing countries in the digital realm. If you're interested in following up, following our work, of course, we've got the... Um, We've got the uh, web pages, we've got a Twitter account. You can see us in Instagram. The addresses are all there. Come and join the social platforms that we do. I want to just finish by saying that these digital online tools are now so widely available that that is not the problem. The problem is that how do we enhance the localization of these opportunities? Because that is the only way for the true impacts. Participation and community-driven actions, they genuinely increase the ownership and resilience to data and knowledge creation processes. What I've learned over these years is that magic happens usually when you step out of your comfort zone. It's not always easy in the academic life, but it's necessary in order to renew the way, ways we work. It's not that I have worked like this all my career. It's because this is the way things have naturally evolved when you see what works and what does not work. And what, I've, what I think is one of the big problems in the current um, way, ways we do science is that we have a lot of single initiatives, projects, funding instruments, which are not holistic enough to bridge the gap between the scientific work of science, open science, what we do within our organizations to that of the society's openness and advancement that need driven wealth. So I would really like to see much more effort on accelerating open science for larger societal impacts. And it does start by, by asking a simple question that when we do research with open data with related to these skills and, and solutions, then what is it that we are going to do it for? Who is going to use all this knowledge and opportunity? If we put that one in the front line, it takes us much, much faster into the, into the uh, acceleration phase. I thank you for your attention. I hope the story was fruitful and I hope I did not over time too much. Thank you.